Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. My name is Jessica McElroy, and I am the Executive Director of the BC Sustainable Energy Association. We are hosting this webinar today as part of the Energy Forum, which is a collaboration of British Columbian power producers, industry associations, and non-government organizations that are working together to address the challenges and opportunities presented by the nexus of energy, climate, and ecosystems. We would like to thank everyone for attending today and thank each of our guests for their participation. We have three guests, each of which are running for re-election on May 9th. We have with us George Heyman of the BC NDP, the candidate in the Vancouver Fairview riding. George served as the opposition spokesperson for the environment, green economy, and technology. His previous role to being an MLA was being in the executive director of the Sierra Club of BC and was at one time head of the BC Government and Services Employees Union. We are also joined by Jordan Sturdy, the BC Liberal candidate for West Vancouver Sea to Sky. Jordan held the roles of Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment and was the chair of the Climate Leadership Team. He was previously the mayor of Pemberton, where he owns and operates a farm with his family. And we have Andrew Weaver, the leader of the BC Green Party and candidate for Oak Bay Gordon Head. Andrew is a professor at the University of Victoria and has acted as the lead author of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Second, Third, Fourth, and Fifth Scientific Assessments. Each of the party representatives have been asked to join us today to answer some questions that have been prepared by members of the Energy Forum and to answer some questions from our audience. Our theme for the discussion today is on the energy industry in BC, development and economic opportunities, and aspects of the transition to a low carbon economy. We ask that the audience submit questions into the question box of the GoToWebinar software, and please try to stick to this theme. We do have team members behind the scenes that are filtering through questions, and while we won't be able to get to everyone's question, we will do our best to look for common themes and diversity in the questions. For the format, we will ask one question at a time, asking each of our guests to then reply to that same question. As this is not a debate, we've asked each guest to answer the question concisely from their party's point of view and not make direct reference to the other guests' responses. We will vary the order in which the guests answer the questions. And overall, we hope that the answers provide, uh, provided today inform voters as they head to the polls on May 9th. So we'll jump in. Now, for the first question, we will have uh, George answer first, and then Jordan, and then Andrew. Our first question is, how will your party work to promote an overall transition to a clean and renewable energy future? George, go ahead. Oh, I think we need to unmute, George. Great. Sorry, I just lost the picture there for a moment. Uh, we will um, concentrate on a number of things to transition to a clean energy future. First of all, uh, we think there's such a, a tremendous move towards renewable energies around the world. We've seen in the last six years the cost of renewables uh, drop by very close to 50 percent. Uh, other countries, including ones that are very dependent on fossil fuels, have been moving rapidly uh, directly to renewables. A year and a half ago we put together a plan which we called Power BC. Uh, we thought it would be a modern plan that would focus on a number of areas that could really assist British Columbians both with energy conservation, uh, promoting renewable energy, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, saving money, as well as creating jobs. So we started with the fact that uh, we have public buildings in British Columbia that are using uh, huge amounts of unnecessary uh, energy and by engaging in a massive retrofit program of public buildings we could save uh, British Columbia taxpayers a very very significant amount of money over the four hundred dollar million dollars a year that we're currently that we're currently spending we also thought that if we institute a, a revolving loan program through a pay-as-you-save, we could then offer those benefits of energy retrofits to commercial businesses, to uh, residential homeowners, and drive down the, the need for and cost of short-term and medium-term uh, energy that would benefit people's living standards as well as their quality of life as well as the overall demand on uh, the energy system in British Columbia. We also know that we have 
a number of uh, dams in British Columbia that provide us with a very, very good base load of power. For instance, if we, in, if we installed the six turbine at Revelstoke, we would provide about 45% of the capacity of Site C at about 1 18th of the cost. Uh, that is capacity, not new energy, but it is important. Uh, we also have aging infrastructure and existing demands that we could improve. And finally, we think with the dropping price and increasing efficiency of renewables, as well as the potential for geothermal, if we bring in uh, new power on a distributed basis, an incremental basis, as we need it, we'll save money for ratepayers, we'll benefit from the job creation in every corner of the province, as we will with energy conservation, and we will transition directly to a much more modern energy future instead of investing growing amounts of, uh, of money in one single project that a recent study said isn't cost effective for British Columbia. Thank you. Jordan? Oh, sorry, you'll need to unmute, Jordan. How's that? Okay, thank you. Are we there? Yes. Yeah. B BC is a leader in uh, the world fight against climate change, and in part is because of our greatest assets in access to clean and renewable electricity, which is there in, in part because of uh, historical investments over the decades, and in part because of, uh, of access to renewable energy through the independent power projects um, developed over the last 15 years. But this is there in, in many ways to help support and will support BC's economic growth and clean energy and clean tech in a clean economy. BC's, today's BC Liberals welcome the challenge of reducing emissions even further while continuing to create jobs and create and keep BC's economy diverse and strong and growing. I think it's well recognized now that 98% of our electricity is already clean or renewable and we are in a very enviable position. Our hydro rates are amongst the lowest in North America. And this energy advantage is critical in part to um, support the government's clean, a climate leadership plan to reduce species, greenhouse gas emissions, encouraging transition to clean, renewable electricity in transport and industrial sectors, as well as homes and buildings. I think we do need to look at what our our energy consumption is in British Columbia and how much of it is electricity. And um, I'm understanding that it's really only in the neighborhood of 25% of our energy consumption overall is electricity. So we have um, much of the economy still to transition off fossil fuels and um, into clean energy. Uh, Canada is, um, we, British Columbia has, has well been repeated time and again, we do have the Canada's fastest growing economy and through prudent fiscal management, we're able to invest more than $2 billion a year to expand, upgrade and maintain the province's electrical generation, transmission and distribution system. And this will allow us to meet growing demand for electricity and support the clean energy actions outlined in the climate leadership plan and in, include our commitment to make British Columbia's electricity 100% clean and renewable. Thanks. Thank you, Jordan. Andrew, and we'll make sure that you're <laughs> unmuted. Thank you. This uh, is this plan that we have is predicated. It begins with a recognition that in order to transition to a carbon-free society, we need to put a price on emissions. That's why we've proposed very aggressive price on emissions to continue the leadership that BC used to have in this area. Our proposal is to increase the carbon price by ten dollars a year for the next five years. Uh, sorry, next uh, uh, four years to bring it to seventy dollars a ton, when the rest of Canada will be at fifty dollars a ton, as per the uh, federal Liberal uh, promise uh, with the provinces. Uh, our goal there, is, and the purpose of this 
this is to ensure that like we were in the past, leaders lead, we don't follow, we, we set the stage, we send a signal to the market that in British Columbia, we want to lead, we want the clean energy sector back here in BC to thrive. So that's the first thing we do. The second thing was we have to recognize that we have to empower people to be able to actually move to the carbon, uh, carbon low carbon economy. So we would invest heavily in, in terms of electric vehicle infrastructure, but it's more than that. It's more than just investing in the, in the, in the, in the infrastructure. It's about changing the, the, the way that, that uh, infrastructure is placed. Right now, municipalities have a barrier. Uh, uh, malls, uh, homes have a barrier to the introduction of electric vehicle chargers because they cannot actually sell the electricity unless they register unless they register as a utility. Now, that's a piece of red tape that we would eliminate. We'd allow uh, the, the systems are ready to set up, ready to go, to build per use. We would ensure that that could happen, which would allow people to start investing in uh, and third parties to invest in, in electric vehicle infrastructure. We'd introduce a ZEV standard, zero emission vehicle standard that meets or beats California standard. We know the market is there. We know we are a, a jurisdiction that's second to none to be able to take advantage of it. We'd also change the mandate of BC Hydro, stop the Site C dam, which has kill, killed the clean energy se sector. We would ensure that we would uh, partner with First Nations, one of your later questions, to ensure that we get distributed power on uh, as we need it. Uh, the, the, the problem with Site C, as you know, is it's it's being produced to, it's it's essentially killed the Wind Energy Association's um, involvement in BC. They are now in Alberta, left BC. Uh, in addition, the geothermal, Canadian Geothermal Energy Association has left. People have given up on BC for clean energy, where we used to be leaders, and we we can we believe we can regain that leadership by ensuring new capacity is done in, in partnership with local communities. Uh, uh, and, and BC Hydro's mandate is, is starting to get into the business of matching consumer with producer of power and ensuring that they are there to level the load and also ensure that they're there to get power from where it's produced to where it's uh, consumed. Uh, our, our plan, there's more of it and details on BC Green slash platform and I encourage uh, viewers to go there. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, in a related thread, we're now going to ask, how will your party support both the creation and sustainability of local jobs in the clean and renewable energy sector? Uh, for this question, we'll go in the order of Andrew and then George and then Jordan. So Andrew, back to you. Thank you. Uh, as a follow-up, in, in essence, to the previous question, uh, I mentioned and, and raised the issue of changing the mandate of British Columbia Hydro. Right now, there are First Nations across British Columbia wanting to work in partnership um, with uh, power producers to, uh, you know, you can look at successful models like the Lytton Band and, and like uh, in, in Tofino and, and Port Alberni. There's many examples of great partnerships between the, 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 the local First Nations as well as power producers and, and, uh, and BC Hydro. And so our goal would be to, to through the, the elimination of continuation on Site C, we know we'll save something to the order of $1.6 billion if we do that, um, that we would ensure that new power would be produced from bottom-up process and we just let the proposals that are there that are we it's not like government has to do anything the, the, the industry first nations they're ready to come we had a, an example as edp renewables uh, of five first nations on southern vancouver island uh, or on vancouver island as well as um timber west wanted to invest 800 million dollars in a wind power capacity in, in on vancouver island they've since simply walked from that project because again there's no ability uh, as bc hydro is the only purchaser of power for them to do it because bc hydro is going down the path of building site c so that so that we can actually deliver power to a non-existent LNG industry. So, so we would uh, we would um, you know go back uh, to uh, the way we, we used to develop power, which is incrementally as as demand is needed. Great, thank you. And second, we will have George. I believe you need to check if you're muted, George. Thank you. Uh, you know, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, when small power producers really got their uh, start in BC in, in the 90s, it was because of a decision by an NDP government to sell the downstream benefits of uh, Columbia River and open up space internally. So uh, while it wasn't a uh, huge uh, independent power production at that time, it certainly was a good beginning. I think it's important when we're talking about local jobs as well as the growth of the renewable energy sector to look at it from uh, both a demand side management and a production perspective. I think we all know that the cheapest power is the power we don't use. Uh, it's good for people, it's, uh, it's good for ratepayers. it's good for taxpayers, and that's why the first element of Power BC is uh, on an ongoing uh, demand side management 
energy retrofit program in every corner of British Columbia that will develop skilled people. Uh, we can uh, target and, uh, and support women, First Nations, people from every uh, socioeconomic strata to develop the trades and skills needed that uh, will be needed for uh, many, many years to come in uh, energy conservation and retrofit activity. As we do this, of course, the cost end of renewables continues to drop. The uh, technology and efficiency of renewables continues to get better, which make them, of course, that much more viable an option, whether for a domestic consumption or for export. So I think those two elements go hand in hand. If we develop renewables on a distributed uh, pattern around the province, that's good for communities, uh, it's good for minimizing transmission loss, uh, and it's good for a distributed system that is reliable. We have these great dams that act as batteries, and in addition, uh, battery storage technology is improving. Uh, Andrew's quite right that uh, Canadian Wind Energy Association essentially threw up its hands when I meet with members of the Energy Forum and Clean Energy BC. I get a lot of frustrated comments about um, feeling held back by the low demand in BC for the foreseeable future because of this massive expenditure on one big dam that is squeezing everything else out. The same is true for geothermal. And it's worth noting uh, that Harry Swain, as head of the uh, joint review panel that reviewed Site C, said once again, 30 years ago, Hydro was told to explore geothermal. Nobody did it. It should be done because geothermal has opportunities all over BC, both for energy production, but for spin-off job creation by recapturing and reusing the heat from geothermal in any number of applications, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, greenhouses, whether it's horticulture, whether it's spas, whether it's tourism, uh, there is tremendous local economic opportunity here that is indirect jobs from geothermal. There's such a range of economic opportunity that can be distributed in every community around BC that frankly, it stumps me why we're not doing it but we're certainly looking forward to bringing it uh, into play in BC for an entirely new economic future. Great, thank you, George. Jordan? Let's lay the basis for a green economy and creating investments, uh, jobs across the province. BC is leading the country in job creation under the Climate Leadership Plan. We will reduce emissions by 25 megatons and produce uh, or generate some 66,000 new jobs. We're also focusing on expanding the clean energy vehicle program to encourage British Columbians to adopt electric vehicles, which in turn reduces GHG emissions. This builds on our leadership position with, um, in fact, the highest per capita adoption of electric vehicles in Canada and the largest charging infrastructure network in the country. And it, it's interesting, I think that we're at a time where there's a bit of a, there's a seismic change taking place. Uh, we have a, in Squamish, a, a, a bank of uh, Tesla chargers, I think there's six or seven of them. And, and historically, they just have, have been unused. I was there, and I know this is yeah, it's the anecdote, but I was there yesterday and, five of the seven chargers, there was cars there. And this is a, a huge change. And uh, with the uh, clean energy vehicle um, incentives, uh, we're spending 71 or have spent 71 over a million over five years um, uh, with, um, uh, what is it? It's a, I think we're doing, going forward a $40 million program, 5K or $5,000 rebate or a point of sale incentive to go electric or 6,000 to go uh, hydrogen uh, combined with a scrap it program and you've got a 11 or $12,000 um, point of sale incentive as well. Um, uh, we, we've capped it so that I think it's $77,000 is a maximum price for these vehicles. So as they become more available, uh, as they're in, in dealerships, as people see uh, that these um, the opportunities there and the, the quality is there and the range is there that they need, we're going to see additional adoption. And, and transportation, the transportation sector, is 40% of our emissions. 
this is uh, we're, and, and those emissions are essentially going to have to go to zero. So there is going to be significant adoption and um, site C is as referred to one of those batteries that is going to allow us to bring on all range of renewables. We talked about, there was a mention of geothermal and the geothermal opportunity. We see this regularly. And, and we in fact tap in, in the sea to sky and uh, the meager $35 million was spent trying to develop a geothermal opportunity. The problem was the geology wasn't right. The heat is there, the water's not. So it is not some panacea. It is, um, there, there is opportunity. Uh, we acknowledge there's opportunity and there will be increasing opportunity to access and to be contributors to the overall grid, but we do need the base power in place and Site-C will serve us for a for hundred years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Our next question is a little bit more specific. We're asking, does your party believe that the BC LNG industry should be required to use primarily clean energy for its primary electrical loads. So that being that the LNG facilities themselves should be using clean and renew renewable energy for their own energy needs. Uh, for the order of this question, we're gonna have Jordan and then Andrew and then George. So Jordan, back to you. Thanks. Um, so our LNG strategy is designed to provide the cleanest LNG possible around the world. To date, BC has, uh, we have one plant in operation, as we know, it, and uh, one ready for construction and um, export permits, Canadian export permits for another 18 or so, um, when the, if and when the market conditions uh, support them. Um, we uh, put in place, as, as I think all of your listeners know, um, in November 2016, an e-drive electricity rate to uh, encourage LNG proponents to choose electric uh, for compression as part of their final investment decision. And that is exactly what the wood fiber project did to an electric drive when it was originally going to be a, uh, a, a gas burning drive. So providing the e-drive rate to LNG proponents that decide to use electricity for liquefaction provides an incentive to proponents to reduce their emissions. And I can't help but think as time goes on, as we move to global carbon pricing mechanisms, lower, uh, lower carbon intensive uh, LNG supplies are going to be more valuable and there will be, um, uh, there will be a competitive advantage in many ways to uh, have electric drives, uh, renewable electric drives. Yeah, so the e-drive rate is the same as paid by other industrial customers in the provinces, be it them sawmills or, or pulp mills or heavy other large industrial users. And by making this rate available to all LNG proponents, it enforces or reinforces the province's global leadership in reducing harmful GHG emissions while continuing to grow the economy and create jobs for BC families using clean electricity instead of natural gas for compression in the case of, uh, of the wood fiber facility in Squam, which will reduce its uh, GHG footprint by some 80%. So this demonstrates what, why this is an important piece um, going forward in the industry. Thank you, Jordan. Next is Andrew. Thank you. Uh, there's a, a serious disconnect between uh, what's going on politically and what politicians have signed internationally. In the Paris Agreement, there was an international agreement to keep warming below two degrees. We know we've already warmed by more than one degree. We know that we have 0.6 degrees warming in store as a direct consequences as the Earth system equilibrates to existing levels of greenhouse gases if we do no more to keep them fixed. We know we got another 0.2 to 0.3 degrees associated with permafrost carbon feedback. So we know the world's going to warm between 1.8 and 1.9 degrees. It is utterly and entirely inconsistent to invest in new fossil fuel infrastructure if you are a proponent and a signatory of the Paris Agreement. That is one of the reasons 
reasons why the market is collapsing out there is that other jurisdictions recognize this as well. The world is moving away from, from fossil fuels and rather what we're doing here in British Columbia and in Canada is trying to chase a falling stock. It's like buying Nortel at 70 bucks and thinking you got a great deal. We know that the reason why the Saudis are dumping oil on the market is because it's the cheapest stuff to get out of the ground. It's the cheapest stuff to get out of the ground. And so if they get it out first, they know that as the world decarbonizes, they stand to, to profit first. We know that the world's largest reserves of natural gas are Iran, and they've recently had sanctions removed. We know that China has more for, uh, three times more shale gas than all of Canada combined. We know that landed supply in Asia is already out five years from now is cheaper than it costs to get out of the ground here. It is utterly real, unrealistic to think that we are going to have LNG anytime soon here. So actually, I would suggest that this, this, this question is ill-posed because there is no LNG industry in BC and there won't be any LNG industry because the, we are but bit players on the global scene. We've lost the opportunity because the US already has the infrastructure on the coast to meet supply gaps for, for years and years to come. Virtually every company has already left BC, but so desperate um, are, are, are we to land uh, LNG that what decisions are being made to build Site C uh, to subsidize LNG. Site C is going to come in at 13 and a half to 15 cents a kilowatt hour. And then it, to, to, to deliver power to something like wood fiber, which is, uh, you know, it ends up being a subsidy of $440,000 per person per job per year. Those are decisions we would not make. We would not invest in, in, the, in the economies of yesteryear. We would invest in the economies of tomorrow. And that starts by actually recognizing and being truthful and honest that there is no LNG happening here in British Columbia anytime soon because uh, there are a bit, we are bit players on the global scene. The market is well oversupplied. The world is decarbonization. And, and in Canada and BC, we need to get with the program instead of chasing yesterday's economy. You know, again, I, I can point out that for four years in the legislature, I've stood, out, stood and stood against um, LNG pointing out it wasn't going to happen. The same arguments I used in 2012 prior to getting elected in the last election, the same PowerPoint slides I have from those talks, I could show today and point out it was not going to happen. And it was just a kicking, the, you know, kicking tires, uh, kicking some tires and, and trying to figure out what the market's like here. There's, so, so, you know, should, should the BC LNG industry be required to use primary, primary clean energy? I would say the question is moot because there is no BC LNG industry and there won't be any BC LNG industry. And rather than pretending it will happen, uh, you know, I think we need to move on and recognize that we should be leaders in clean tech, new, new energy solutions, not kind of latecomers to a 20th century economy. Thank you, Andrew. George? Thank you. Well, it, it is true. There is uh, yet to be a final investment decision on LA, any LNG plant in uh, in British Columbia, and that's likely a, a combination of uh, supply elsewhere, uh, a much more rapid uh, move to renewables with uh, dropping prices, as as well as some of the uh, difficulties inherent in uh, the economics of uh, the proposals that uh, are being investigated in BC. But having said that, I'll, I'll take the question at face value. And I think we have to start from the premise that the most important thing that we need to do in British Columbia is build a healthy economy, a sustainable economy into the future that meets uh, legislated greenhouse gas reduction targets. Uh, and in order to do that, the climate leadership team was very clear that there needs to be a strategy to electrify any LNG industry uh, that does eventually exist, if it exists. Uh, the, uh, the climate leadership team put forward a number of measures that said, if all of these are done, uh, if you have a balance of regulation and pricing and uh, attack uh, emission reduction in every sector, there is some room for, for LNG under these conditions. The conditions were electrification as well as uh, uh, leak detection and repair and vented methane uh, emission uh, reduction, essentially clamping right down on that. So the answer to the question is uh, BC should require that if there is an LNG industry or a successful uh, proposal that uh, meets other environmental tests, which must include uh, uh, carbon emissions as well as uh, other environmental impacts, then electrification is part of that. Otherwise, the plan doesn't work. Emissions will not meet our legislated targets, including the new one that uh, we have proposed, uh, seeing as we've blown the 2021 of a 30% reduction below 2007 by 2030. Uh, and uh, we'll see where the economics uh, take us. But to simply say, uh, 
we're going to develop an industry with no regard for carbon emissions, uh, uh, with no regard for uh, electrification, and without focusing on the advantages of, uh, of renewables is just uh, not responsible. I don't think it's what British Columbians want. And uh, it actually uh, uh, ultimately is destructive to our economy. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna move uh, through our preset questions a little bit so that we can get to some audience ones sooner, I believe. So we're gonna jump to a question that is more about the export of electricity in BC. So we're asking, to support BC economic development, will your party commit to the development of a long-term ex export strategy for BC clean and renewable electricity? And if so, could you please provide three key elements of that strategy? The order for this question will be George, Jordan, and then Andrew. So we'll start with George. Thank you. Uh, we have tremendous uh, experience, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, and innovation that's been built up in BC and uh, in wind, uh, in, in small hydro, although there's been some environmental problems with some of the projects, I think much has been learned and, uh, and uh, there is some ability there. Uh, and certainly uh, solar is uh, coming on uh, like gangbusters in, in many communities, including uh, First Nations communities. So there's a tremendous opportunity here, which as we mentioned earlier, has been shut down to a, a large extent by uh, the focus on one large uh, mega project that's sucking the air out of the industry. So export opportunities is a chance for the renewable energy sector to uh, have a future, to remain in BC, to create jobs in BC, and to improve and expand uh, our technological edge here. So uh, yes, we would support it, uh, subject to ensuring that uh, the power that's developed, uh, obviously nobody's going to do it, in the private or the public sector if it can't be sold for um, a price that's greater than uh, the price it's produced for. PowerX is an excellent trading organization that can ensure we get uh, best value for this working with producers. We could improve our transmission intertie to Alberta, not for Site C, but for a range of renewable power that could be produced in British Columbia. And uh, finally, we could explore advances in energy storage to uh, ensure that uh, where there is some excess capacity or prices are low, we can store that uh, energy until there's a better time to sell it. Uh, all of these improving technologies are part of the argument that we should be focusing on a smaller scale distributed renewable energy sector that will provide economic opportunity around BC, including the opportunity to uh, export power we don't need if we would support that sector. There are more jobs, it's more cost effective, it's better for taxpayers, there's a better return. Uh, we really should be focusing on that, not on uh, a mega project that increasingly uh, looks like it's going to be um, a gigantic suck of taxpayer resources and dollars because there's no current market, uh, it's gonna go over budget, and it's not the most efficient way to create electricity. Thank you, George. We'll move to Jordan. Thank you. Um, well, again, 75% of our energy consumption in British Columbia is not electricity and will have to eventually be electricity or the bulk of it anyway. And so there is huge, going to be huge demand as time goes on in, in British Columbia, and we're going to need all the energy, all the clean energy options that we have available to us, um, we'll be needing to develop and uh, put in place. But in terms of the direct, the question around the, uh, around uh, export, um, we do have a number of strategies in place and certainly helping Alberta is, uh, is part of it. We want to continue to work with the federal government and, and uh, with the Alberta government in helping them transition to a clean energy future as well. You know that their ambition is 30% of their grid to be renewable in 15 years. Uh, transitioning off coal, the remainder of the, their grid, that other 70% is going to be developed to um, um, and powered by 
natural gas. So, you know, if they are to achieve uh, a clean energy grid, then they're going to, to need help. If solar is going to be part of it. We don't have a great solar profile here in British Columbia. Um, Alberta has some more potential, potential for wind, but that's why they've set a 15-year target for only 30% of their grid. So we, we certainly do want to work with British Columbia to uh, on an intertie to help get the vast um, array of potential in British Columbia, pre clean energy potential um, into the Alberta grid um, in cooperation with the federal, uh, federal government. Um, we also are um, looking at the Columbia River Treaty. As you know, the treaty uh, optimizes flood management and power generation requiring a coordinated operation of reservoir, reservoirs and water flows for the Columbia River and Kootenai Rivers uh, at the, in Canada in the United States. And a hydropower generated by these treaty dams provide clean and re reliable, renewable energy throughout BC and the Pacific Northwest and the power generating facilities in the Columbia and Kootenai generate approximately 45% of the energy or electricity produced in British Columbia. Uh, this, um, the, the Canada's half share of the downstream benefits is uh, our Canadian entitlements. BC sells some of that surplus entitlement to the US, which returns uh, uh, between 100 and $200 million a year to the province. So not only does it, uh, um, it, it creates a, a system for clean power for both countries, but also helps uh, in uh, uh, flood management issues. So there, there are uh, a number of different opportunities, both domestically as well as internationally for power in British Columbia. Thank you, Jordan. Andrew. Thank, thank you. Um, British Columbia already has a um, vibrant export strategy with the PowerX program. We have some of the best and brightest in the world in terms of energy traders at PowerX. Um, honestly, we can do more. The fact of the matter is British Columbia should be the leader in terms of the distributed production of, of, of a renewable energy. We have it all here in BC. We have the potential for tidal, wind like no one else. Uh, to say Alberta has potential when we have a fetch of the size of the Pacific Ocean, uh, is is doesn't it underestimates our potential here. We have we have uh, people wanting to invest in BC. We have small scale hydro. We have biomass. We have the potential for wood pellets. But what's more important is that we need to ensure that we start to position ourselves for the new grid of tomorrow, where we'll have high voltage DC point to point transmission systems. We know right now the cheapest power in the world being developed is solar. So solar fields are feeding into the grid in southern U.S. are coming in at three and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, we know that um, uh, the dams are some of the most expensive way of doing it. We also know that when you start to um, have point-to-point -point transmission with, with, with HVDC where you have less transmission loss, you can actually, and also um, you, you're able to stabilize load as well. So distributed sources stabilize load and we have existing dams that can be used well. So we're, there is a potential for us to build. We should be leaders in this regard to nudge us in that direction. We need the mandate of BC Hydro to be changed. We need to ensure that, that we can actually, you know, build new capacity capacity and deliver it. We had one company, for example, that wanted to, that had the, 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 the ability to build wind, wind power and wanted to, for, for no cost, to build an HVDC, DC, a high voltage DC line from Vancouver Island to California uh, to do a direct transfer of, of wind power energy to the California market. They were declined, of course. And, and, and so, you know, we have barriers here. The other thing is under the Columbia River, River entitlement, if we actually wanted the power that is being done for PSI-C, we could have taken the power that we're currently sending on the spot market in the US at three and a half to four and a half cents a kilowatt hour and use that to actually, you know, uh, fund any hypothetical increase. Again, the reality is that's producing several hundred million dollars a year into directly into the BC coffers, bypassing BC Hydro. So why, why, you know, why, why uh, get rid of a good thing? Um, so, so there are so many options available, but we're stuck in this 20th century mentality of that we have to build dams. We're not thinking about smart grid, grid systems. We're not thinking about point-to-point -point transmission systems. We're still fixated on the big mega project and not on the innovation that the industry out there is willing and ready to do. We just have to get out of the way and let them do it in partnership with BC Hydro. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. 
Uh, so a couple of you, actually, I think everyone has mentioned geothermal at some point during uh, during your answers in the discussion. And we actually have uh, the chair of the Canadian Geothermal Energy Association uh, as an attendee today who joined us. And she has asked specifically, uh, what are your party views on processing more geothermal tenure permits? Uh, and for that question, we're going to have Jordan start, and then Andrew, and then George. Um, I have, I have to tell you the truth, not familiar with um, any um, with the issues of uh, permitting or tenure permitting for geothermal hydro. So um, I, I think it's more about the power call at this point. Thank you, Jordan. Andrew, do you have a response around how your party might? Oh, some? absolutely. We are the only jurisdiction on the Pacific Rim, the only jurisdiction to not have geothermal producing power for the grid. It's remarkable. Yet we have some of the most amazing sites. I stood with the Canadian Geothermal Energy Association, a press conference, pointing out that we are missing out on an opportunity. We know the environmental footprint of geothermal uh, is, is very, very small. It's firm power. It's power that can you be used to, to load level more intermittent sources and, and the, the, the mapping that has been, been done by the Canadian Geothermal Energy Association points out that we have a remarkable potential here. So what is our part? This is ex one of the examples of where we believe the direction needs to go is we need to par partner with those who have the expertise. Uh, you know, BC Hydro does not have that expertise. BC Hydro are dam builders. Uh, it's, it's become, it, we need to ensure that BC Hydro partners with expertise and works with the actual establishment of point-to-point -point, uh, you know, um, uh, grid transmission systems to ensure that BC's vast areas of renewable, including geothermal, which we have huge potential of, are hooked into the North American grid to get others off coal. Because the reality is coal has no future. Natural gas has no future. The only future is cl in clean renewable energy. And we should be continuing leading that, and particularly in the area of ge uh, geothermal energy. Thank you, Andrew. George, do you have a response? I do. Welcome, Allison. Uh, it's good to have you here on the webinar. And uh, I, uh, I remember our meetings and uh, the very compelling case you made for uh, the potential for geothermal, uh, as well as the indirect jobs uh, associated with geothermal, which I, I referenced earlier. Uh, you know, I'm not an expert on, on geothermal, but I do know it is a tremendous uh, potential reservoir of firm power. There's no reason to believe that it doesn't exist in abundance in British Columbia, given our, our situation. Uh, there has been reference to one project that didn't uh, do particularly well, but there were reasons for that that uh, certainly are not necessarily reasons that would apply to other developments. I also mentioned earlier that um, Harry Swain and the Site C Joint Review Panel said one of the problems Hydro has is they were told 30 years ago to explore the potential for geothermal, and it is the responsibility of a public sector body like uh, BC Hydro to actually assist with exploring geothermal opportunities because that is a very capital intensive part of development that is an area where there would be a payoff uh, once we use the uh, the leverage of a, a large public uh, utility to assist with this uh, identifying opportunities for this industry so uh, i think geothermal is part of the mix i don't have a, a specific answer to the uh, tenure permits question because uh, i just simply don't know the mechanics of that uh, but in general terms, I think uh, geothermal has a strong role to play. It has a great job creation potential because of uh, associated indirect benefits. Uh, instead, uh, we're, we're yet choking off yet another uh, great source of employment, great source of economic benefits around British Columbia, great source of, uh, of firm power uh, because we're investing in a technology of the 20th century whose cost profile only rises historically has only risen from original estimates to final costs. Thank you, George. Uh, we've been getting a lot of questions coming in on the other side of the energy picture, and that being conservation efficiency and demand side management. Um, there have been a lot of questions that have related to subsidies and rebates for homeowners. So I'm wondering if you can answer uh, more specifically around what incentives or rebate programs, um, something like existing programs that were in place, 
that uh, have been discontinued or funding was was run out, will those be reestablished or will new programs be developed that will help homeowners undergoing retrofits as well as uh, new construction and builds for increased energy efficiency and conservation? Uh, we will have the order be Andrew, George, and then Jordan. A couple of things. First off, some of the programs that have been discontinued are discontinued because they don't make sense. For example, subsidies for LED bulbs make little sense these days with the costs, uh, you know, dropping from so dramatically that it'd be, yeah, and the fact you can't get incandescents. Uh, uh, so that, so the subsidies are there to get early adopters up first and foremost, and then we get mainstream. It's worked really well on LED lights. You know, most people uh, have a home filled with LED lights, and, and if you know, they're they're not that expensive anymore, and they last. For, for, for years and years and years. Uh, so that the payback is is right away. Um, in terms of other areas, uh, we, we, we have outlined small components in our platform where we will assist through programs that will, uh, you know, allow allow people to, to make energy efficient retrofits in their home and, 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 and access support funds to do so. Uh, again, we, we, we believe that many of these are, are, are really what's, what's important is, is about education, is that people often don't realize that um, they can do simple things and actually reap the benefits very rapidly. Uh, some of these also will come through small building code changes. The, uh, we've also talked about the investment in electric vehicle infrastructure. Uh, so, so yes, we have a, a small program in there that used to exist in BC to assist with with um, retrofits um, and, and assistance with actually having energy. We've also outlined uh, having a people who will assess energy efficiency uh, so that you can, when you're buying a home, you can get a sense of what the energy efficiency of these homes are. And um, so, yeah. Great, thank you. George? Government okay. policy. Sorry? I'll start again. There's two problems with current Liberal government policy. One of them is uh, they've essentially uh, cancelled the Live Smart program, which was a, a program that uh, that offered uh, subsidies, offered incentives, uh, and uh, Mr. Weber is correct. One of the purposes of offering incentives is to get people to adopt early, and by doing that, you get economies of scale and drive down the price. The second problem is uh, BC Hydro and their uh, integrated resource plan had five demand side management models, one to five, uh, one being the most aggressive. BC Hydro was prepared to proceed with option two. And because we're awash in power that we can't sell in BC, and we're about to be awash in even more power, uh, BC Hydro was essentially ordered by the government to uh, drop back to demand side management uh, model three, which is far less aggressive. Uh, we would, in a BC NDP government, adopt a far more aggressive uh, approach to demand side management. We would offer some incentives where appropriate, but we think there's a better way to do it. And the better way to do it is to start by investing in retrofitting uh, public buildings in British Columbia, schools, hospitals, and others. Uh, that costs uh, British Columbians about 400 million tax dollars a year in energy costs. We could drive that down in the case of schools and other buildings that need seismic upgrading. We can do both at the same time. And by doing that, we start to create uh, skilled workers in, uh, in those jobs, more skilled work workers. We can offer apprenticeships. We can uh, drive down the cost by, uh, by building manufacturing industries for some of the, uh, the materials, for instance, um, energy efficient windows that would be used in these. And then we move on to commercial and residential. And I think the best way uh, to do this, uh, many people will take incentives, but not everyone can afford to. If we use the uh, borrowing power of government in a revolving loan program that's seeded with an initial amount, we can then use a pay-as-you-save program for businesses and residents to offer them the incentive to retrofit their building, have the cost of the loan deducted from their energy savings at you know, say 80%, so you get to keep 20 of it off the top. There's an immediate incentive. Uh, the, the comfort level goes up. The intrinsic value of the home goes up. The loan can be attached to the property, not the individual. And when it's paid off, then you have um, essentially great personal savings or business savings. And you have the money back in the program again to continue to lend. You're offering people. Uh, the only downside is, of course, the disruption to have the work done, but most people have that uh, have experienced that if they've done 
any kind of renovation at all. So we think, and that's part of our Power BC plan, it's the first principle of Power BC, that we can have a revolution in economic opportunity around the province, as well as uh, energy conservation around the province. If we follow these principles, there's no reasons uh, not to do it, and we would proceed immediately. Okay. Thank you, George. Jordan. Thanks. Yes, no, it's, a, it's an interesting question as we go forward, looking at, um, at how industry evolves, how supply evolves, um, and the products that we are, um, are purchasing now are just so much more efficient. The, the, the opportunities that looking backwards to, to retrofit are, are certainly a challenge. Um, I, I think that our future, though, holds the the opportunity to look at changing business, our building codes, at improving efficiencies in the built environment, um, at technologies like passive house type of technologies that need to be integrated into our building systems. You know, I, 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 when we look at something like the 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 example provided earlier around um, LED type of, uh, of bulbs and, and illumination where we really are seeing it, we're seeing it going from a 75 watt bulb to a you know, three or four watt bulb and those efficiencies are there and they're there going forward. So it, um, it does limit some of that opportunity um, to the low hanging fruit in other words has, has um, often been taken advantage of. Certainly, as we work with local governments um, in in smart communities, in communities that have are, are transit oriented, these are are other ways that we can take advantage of um, of a greener future and a lower energy future, uh, district energy type of opportunities, and. Um, um, in and more in or certainly in urban BC where some of these um, incentives are, or some of these opportunities are a little easier to take advantage of than in uh, in more rural parts of the province of British Columbia but it, it um, certainly the the future future builds um, are going to be um, cleaner tighter and uh, and certainly more efficient Great, thank you. All right, we're going to have one last question that has come from our audience, and we're going to ask each of you to keep the answer as close to about a minute as you can. And it's a, just a bigger, uh, sort of broader looking future question, and is on your predicted energy outlook for BC in 50 years from now. So, what do you see? And the question specifically is the baseline and peak power in that vision, but maybe a broader idea of what do you think the energy picture is going to look like? In BC in 50 years from now and we'll start with uh, George and then go Andrew and then Jordan well I'll try to be quick and I think I'll focus on what I believe the energy uh, picture needs to look like if we're going to have um, a world a province uh, inherited by our children and grandchildren that's livable so it will be uh, it will involve uh, zero emission vehicles. It will involve uh, tremendous uh, public and publicly accessible modes of transit. It will involve uh, heritage buildings that have been retrofitted uh, to be as close to uh, uh, passive house standards as possible. It will have uh, net zero uh, housing and buildings. It will have green spaces and it will be an energy future built on uh, renewable electricity, tremendous advances in in solar and a whole range of renewables integrated with uh, integrated with great advances in storage capacity and uh, the tremendous economic opportunities that are associated with all of these things which will lead to skilled workers making decent livings in livable communities uh, with a quality of life where we've dealt with the greatest challenge facing us in our generation and that's getting serious about climate change and not simply pretending to take it seriously. Great. Andrew? Thank you. I, I love thinking about the future. I love the thought of what 
world will be like in 50 years. And what's important is that we position ourselves to be leaders in this. 50 years from now, people will look back and look at this generation that we have had and said, why did you not take advantage of these economic opportunities uh, sooner? We'll have the elimination of air travel it, through using jet fuel. We'll be using hi uh, hyperloops. We'll be having electric, you know, Elon, Musk, Vic, Elon Musk's vision of electric airplanes. We'll be producing power, distributed power, all across the world with point-to-point con -point connection systems, smart grids, Howers, uh, houses will be net neutral, houses will be use used as batteries to load levels so that the power they produce with their solar towels, tires in the day is stored in in-house battery systems and fed to the grid when needed to level loads. Their cars will be plugged in and will also be used as systems and also be used to level loads. We'll have highly sophisticated grid systems that, and people will then revalue the fact that, you know, they'll look back at us and said, why did you take, you know, extract your natural resources in such a Laraxian manner? Why did you not think about our generation? Why did you not put first and foremost, you know, our needs in decision making? Why is it that you were building Site C Dam when you knew full well you could have invested in the technology of tomorrow? I would dream, I, my dream is that BC be a leader in that regard. BC be a leader in innovation and technology in that regard and we can do it because we have three three things that no one else in the world have we have the most educated and skilled workforce and we have we live in the most beautiful part of the world so we can attract and retain the best and brightest we live in a stable democracy and 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 and, and we have access to renewable resources that are second to none so i um, got into politics because i wanted to bring back bc leadership in this regard and i still think we can do it because it's never too late Thank you, Andrew. Jordan, we'll close with your remarks. Well, thank you, and and that is really a, a great question. Um, it it our I agree with Andrew. I think our future. I think all of us agree that we have a tremendous opportunity here in British Columbia. Uh, we have a range of renewable energy options that is virtually unlimited. We have that that quality of life and and. Um, uh, a stable political system, a good banking system and finance system, um, incredible innovative people and institutions that are focusing on these kind of, of, uh, of issues and uh, speculating on how the future, our future energy supply looks is, uh, is a fascinating and intriguing um, um, opportunity or, or um, pastime to some degree. It's a, it, I, we have unlimited potential, and I, you know, we see what some of these people are doing even now. I look at at um, uh, things like carbon engineering, which is in in Squamish that does atmospheric carbon capture with the uh, one, uh, which is a Virgin Earth Prize finalist, looking at uh, creating uh, transportation fuels out of atmospheric carbon. I, whether that scales and proves itself, I, I, we'll see. But it's, um, it, it's a type of activity that is uh, demonstrating global leadership right here in British Columbia. Um, what, is fusion going to play out? Yes, we'll we'll see, but certainly those the, the energy uh, and the, uh, something like that can can change the whole paradigm. So I have tremendous confidence in um, what we are doing here in British Columbia, what the private sector is doing, what the um, uh, academic and institutional sectors are doing, and we in British Columbia um, have great opportunity, and and it's incumbent on us to support those initiatives in that positive future. Great, thank you. So thank you all for joining us and thank to each of our candidates and taking time out of your very busy campaign schedules. And for a couple of you, I know it's been like Groundhog Day doing these repeated uh, activities together over and over, but we thank you for your time. So our goal today was to provide information relevant to the interests of the members of the Energy Forum and the citizens, industry and community members, businesses that we represent as we prepare to vote on May 9th. We hope that the answers provided have given some food for thought. The recording of this webinar will be available through the BCSA website shortly, uh, and we will actually provide all of the candidates that joined us today with a list of the questions that were asked, so you can see what some of the interests were. There were quite a few that we didn't get a chance to respond to, so we'll send those to you. And we wish all of the candidates well during the remainder of your campaign period. Thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>